tonight, and uh, I would like to thank Dr. Um, Alan Lamston, the current president of the uh, International Society of Endovascular Specialists, as well as Dr. Crazer, the uh, president of the Houston chapter, uh, for being with us tonight and uh, helping uh, with this uh, program. So we're going to start, and uh, my co-moderator is uh, Dr. Palma Shaw. She's a professor of surgery and uh, director of the fellowship program at the Upstate Medical Center in New York. And she's going to um, join us tonight um, uh, via the web. And I would like also to introduce the other um, um, uh, panelists. Uh, the topic tonight is aortic challenges from uh, root to uh, bifurcation. And we're very actually happy to have this, um, um, issue, uh, this uh, chapter tonight, and the reason is, is really focused on um, young trainees and uh, uh, young faculty. So we have a distinguished panel, uh, panelist. Is, um, we have the first one is Dr. Rana Fifi uh, from uh, University of Texas, McGovern. Uh, uh, Dr. Afifis is the current uh, program director of the Advanced Aortic Fellowship, as well as the new elected associate medical director of the Southern uh, um, Vascular Quality Initiative. And uh, she is the director of the Women's Vascular and Cardiac uh, Interdisciplinary Health Initiative at uh, McGovern. We also have uh, Dr. Jason Lee, uh, Dr. Lee actually is really a great honor. Uh, in uh, nine days from now, he's going to be the Chief of Vascular Surgery at the Stanford in California. Uh, also, we have with us uh, Dr. Uh, Tom McGillivray. Um, Dr. McGillivray is the current uh, Chief of the Cardiac and Thoracic Surgery, as well as Cardiac Transplantation at Houston Methodist. And also, he is the um, uh, Vice President of the Society of Thoracic uh, Surgeons. Also, we have um, Dr. Uh, Rodney White. He's the current Medical Director of the Vascular uh, Surgery at the um, uh, Long Beach Memorial Hospital and Professor Emeritus at the Harbor UCLA. And he has a long history uh, training residents as well as Dr. Mar uh, Mark Archie, faculty at the UCLA Harbor. And uh, of course, I would like to thank, and it's a great honor to have with us, uh, the legendary uh, Dr. Uh, Frank Vith. Uh, Dr. Vith has uh, more than 40 year history of um, getting involved with endovascular, de uh, endovascular devices. And uh, he's really the, um, uh, main force of the VIT Symposium which is taking, um, is taking place at least for the last uh, uh, 40 years uh, is one of the more um, um, well attended national and international meetings in the United States and the, every year is taking place in uh, New York in November and this particular year due to the COVID is going to take place in uh, Orlando. So really, we are extremely honored to have, um, again, he's going to join us online, uh, Dr. Uh, Frank Vith. And I would like to have uh, uh, Dr. Shaw introduce the presenters. Uh, Palma. I'm excited to be here tonight. Um, Dr. Jonathan Ong is uh, from the Baylor College of Medicine. He's one of the cardiac uh, surgery fellows and aortic fellows. Uh, Ross Rule is one of the Baylor College of Medicine uh, medical students. Dr. Furkan Mukri is at my institution, SUNY Upstate Medical University. Dr. Ahmed Karmour is joining us from Harbor UCLA. Lizzie George is joining us from Stanford University. Um, Dr. Michael Harms from Texas Heart Institute. Dr. Travis Vowles from Houston Methodist and Dr. Kate Peng from UT Health. Um, what I'd also like to mention is um, an important aspect of the ISCVS is the Young Endovascular Specialist. The ISCVS Young Endovascular Specialist concept was proposed initially by Drs. Jason Lee and Christopher Zarens in 2010. This group comprised of young specialists in interventional therapies who were under 10 years in practice. And involvement in the ISCVS will provide networking opportunities for young interventionalists, building their practice to become more involved 
with industry trials and have access to the latest technologies and procedures. Additionally, we hope to foster an environment of mentoring, teaching, and role modeling for young international interventionalists with access to expert thought leaders through the website and at the annual Congress. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Rania to get started. Okay, so our first case is going to be um, acute type aortic dissection with malperfusion, and it's going to be presented by um, uh, Jonathan Hong and uh, Rolls Rule Jr. All right, good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to present tonight uh, with the ISCVS. My name is Michael Rule, and I'm a fourth year medical student at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, with me tonight is Dr. Jonathan Hong, cardiac surgeon and aortic fellow at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, we will be pre presenting a case uh, of a type one aortic dissection with a rare complication. We hope this will be educational and lead to a great discussion. Uh, here are our disclosures. So our patient was a 36-year-old male who presented to an outside institution. He presented with severe tearing chest pain radiating to his back and left leg. The patient uh, was obese at around 300 pounds, but he had no prior medical conditions and was otherwise previously healthy. Um, he did have a family history of an aortic aneurysm in his father that was repaired at a young age, um, but he had no stigmata of connective tissue disorder. So at the outside hospital, he got a CT scan, which demonstrated a type 1 aortic dissection going from the aortic root to the aortic bifurcation. Uh, we thought that the initial tear was within the aortic arch at the left carotid artery. He uh, had radiographic evidence of malperfusion with a severely, uh, severely compressed true lumen, and he also had a uh, radiographic evidence of a partial obstruction of the left, iliac, the left common iliac artery. So when he presented to our institution, he was hemodynamically stable, um, no evidence of end organ damage, although he did have uh, clinical evidence of malperfusion to the left leg. We took him emergently to the operating room, at which point we got a transesophageal echo, which showed that the uh, dissection flap was extending into the aortic valve and uh, that he had some severe aortic regurgitation. Uh, I will now hand off to Dr. Hong to discuss the details of the procedure. Nice. Um, so for cardiopulmonary bypass, we use the innominate artery for arterial inflow in the venous cannula in the right atrium. We ended up cooling the patient to 24 degrees, and upon opening up the aorta, we noticed that the intimal tear was along the greater curvature just adjacent to the left common carotid. In uh, blue, it's a little hard to see on the screen, but in blue describes the ascending and partial aortic arch replacement we performed. The, the green represents uh, the endovascular repair under direct visualization, and in particular, we deployed an express stent into the left common carotid artery and a gore C tag into the proximal uh, descending thoracic aorta. Uh, we resuspended the aortic valve, and uh, the aortic root was in intact. Um, Cardiopulmonary bypass time was uh, 169 minutes, cross clamp time 123 minutes, and we protected the brain using ACP um, via the innominate and left common carotid. Um, in a case like this, we would have performed a total arch replacement with a frozen elephant trunk, but the exposure in this patient was not ideal given his uh, obesity and his haughty habitus. Um, upon weaning from cardiopulmonary bypass, we noticed that the right femoral arterial line was no longer pulsatile, and there was a clear discordance uh, between the femoral and the radial arterial line. The patient also had low urine output, and at this time we were concerned for distal aortic malperfusion. We uh, dried up the patient expeditiously, and the patient was an acidotic, kind of suggesting that the perfusion to the celiac and SMA was intact. Um, we decided to go to the CT scan to further characterize um, the distal malperfusion. And this here is um, the post 
proximal repair CT, and you can see that the true lumen was even more compressed than prior. It was almost like a pinhole. And at this time, we were concerned that the distal portion of the anti-grade T-var was actually deployed into the false lumen. So we uh, took the patient to the hybrid suite emergently, and um, we obtained bilateral percutaneous groin access. Uh, we had confirmed we were in the true lumen using IVIS, and on the right side of the screen is um, an angiogram demonstrating severe compression of the true lumen. We then ma manipulated a wire from the true lumen distally, and we found a fenestration that was proximal to the celiac artery and went into the false lumen and subsequently into the anti-grade T-var. We uh, then used a uh, balloon to enlarge the fenestration to reestablish flow into the true lumen, and we uh, stabilized the true lumen by using a Cook dissection stent from um, the anti-grade T-var that was in the false lumen across the fenestration into the true lumen. And then we also ended up uh, repairing the common iliac with an express dent as well. Here's our completion angiogram demonstrating um, increased perfusion of the true lumen. And um, on the left is a uh, 3D reconstruction CT um, prior to discharge. So on arrival to the cardiac ICU after the procedure, uh, there was clinical evidence to suggest that there was good uh, perfusion of the, di of the distal aorta. Um, although the patient had a complicated post-operative course, he was, a, uh, he was ultimately discharged to a rehab facility three weeks following his initial encounter. Um, we decided to report on this case because we believe it highlights um, some important discussion points. Uh, namely, the indications for an anti-grade T-var during a type 1 aortic dissection repair, the steps we can take to mitigate uh, placement of a T-var into the false lumen, and also endovascular techniques to reestablish flow into the true lumen if you find yourself in a similar complication. So thank you, and we open up the floor to discussion now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. So I um, would like actually to have uh, one of our panelists, uh, Dr. Uh, McGillivray, to comment on the case. Thanks, Rania. Congratulations on a terrific case presentation. And I think this case uh, is reflective of many of the acute type A or acute type 1 dissections that we commonly see and that uh, expect the unexpected. Uh, certainly when patients present, uh, it's important to be on the lookout for malperfusion and more importantly, malperfusion syndromes. And that uh, seems like he had malperfusion to the lower extremity when he presented. Um, you know, one of the big decisions to be made at the time of operation is what operation you're going to do. Uh, and in part, that's a reflection on what operation does the patient need and what operation are you uh, facile at doing? And, and uh, so that uh, you, you had mentioned that there was a, the, the usual plan would have been to do a total arch replacement and a uh, frozen elephant trunk on him. And I think appropriately for uh, anatomic considerations, uh, doing uh, the operation that you did was, I think, uh, quite uh, appropriate. Um, I guess I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, so how did you cannulate him initially? Yeah, um, so, so we cannulate...
indications for doing one of those procedures and, and uh, optimally the uh, total arch with an elephant trunk in this case uh, would be the patient who, uh, have a, who have an intimal tear in the distal arch or at least supporting aorta, uh, young patients who have uh, known, who might have known connective disease or known aneurysmal disease, um, it would be uh, patients with a dilated arch or distal uh, arch or descending or thoracoabdominal aorta where we think that we might need to go back for another operation and so to have that um, distal exposure is uh, useful. Um, anything else? Yeah, and then, and then in this particular case, not only was the patient young, but there was also evidence of mouth effusion right. with a severely <laughs> compressed true lumen, so. Yeah, it was very, it was very uh, yeah. impressive how compressed the true lumen was. I, and I guess the, one of the key points of, of, of this patient's uh, course was, you know, it can be very difficult to differentiate between the true and the false lumen. Yeah. Both at the level of the transected arch, and then yeah. as you as you advance the stent uh, yeah. graft distally, how do you, how do you what I, what techniques yeah. do you use to prevent so, going to the false lumen? So I think this is a great teaching case for us. Um, so now, before going on cardiopulmonary bypass, we get a right femoral or left femoral arterial access, and we actually put a collide wire into the ascending aorta. Then on TEE, we um, confirm the orientation of that wire into the true lumen, and we uh, deploy the anti-grade TVAR over the wire now, and um, that seems to have mitigated this risk. You know, I think this is a rare complication, and it uh, probably happened because the anti-grade TVAR was originally in the true lumen and probably passed into the false lumen through a penetration. And with the aorta collapse like that, it was, it was hard to tell. Well, I would, I would say you're falling on the sword when you should be brandishing the sword. I, th these are very difficult cases, and I right. think that uh, they can be very difficult to avoid getting into the false lumen. And I think that the vigilance that you and your team showed at uh, being on the lookout for malperfusion after the operation. It's very easy to kind of high five each other and you know head uh, head home but to, but to identify and to be you know, to be able to go in and salvage that situation I think uh, deserves great uh, great congratulations. Awesome I appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. And um, it's true, actually, that uh, the times that we um, do uh, place like a stent in the descending thoracic aorta during a type 1 dissection, uh, we started actually with uh, when we have cases of malperfusion. And um, on our original paper, we have shown that uh, patients with malperfusion, they may be benefit. Like long term, is more about um, the descending thoracic aorta to get um, remodeling. But of course, more studies need to be done and longer follow-up is needed. The, the length of your gross melting time seems a bit... Uh, usually we use um, uh, 10 centimeters. Uh, and also we have shown that uh, more than 10 centimeters, we can increase the paraplegia rate. Now, because we have to go into the second case, I would like to see if Dr. Vith is actually um, online, if uh, he has any comment on the case. Dr. Vith? <laughs> Uh, Dr. Vith, on your line. Okay. Okay, you got it? Okay. Yes. First, first of all, it's a real pleasure and honor to be part of this uh, incredible meeting. Uh, secondly, this is an absolutely uh, unbelievable case with, with a brilliant outcome. And, uh, a lot of it's over my head. I have one comment and a couple of questions. The comment is, I think... The, the real brilliant part of this case was getting uh, a connection back from your graft in the false lumen back into the true lumen. I think that really is, uh, was first of all, brilliant and secondly, successful. My questions are, when you went on uh, bypass, how were you sure that you weren't refusing into the, the false lumen when you got into the phenomenon? What if that was the second? Uh, would you possibly be refusing into the false lumen? And that would have been the end of the case. My second question is, how did you 
resuspend the incompetent aortic valve. That's way over my head, but I'd like to hear how you did that. Thank you, Dr. Vith. Uh, Jonathan, Jonathan, you want to answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, in in a terms of, so so the spot that we choose to cannulate is um, an area that's free of dissection. And after after we go on pump, we go on pump very slowly to kind of ensure that we are perfusing the true lumen. And while we're on pump, um, we also continue to monitor for any evidence of an organ ischemia and any evidence that we may be um, perfusing the false lumen, such as using the nears or um, checking a distal arterial line like a femoral artery, um, and also confirming on TEE as well. Um, with, with respect uh, to your question about resuspending the aortic valve, um, here in this case, the aortic root was dissected, but it wasn't severely destroyed. It, and on the transesophageal echo, it appeared like the dissection flat was actually prolapsing across the aortic valve, which was interfering with it. So in uh, this particular case, we uh, just uh, tack up um, the aortic valve at the commissures to, to help stabilize the aortic annulus. Thank you, okay. Dr. Vith. Uh, thank you for being here. So um, uh, Dr. Shaw is going to, Palma, you're going to introduce the second one. The second case. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. The next presenter is Dr. Farhan Mukri, who will present time intervention for type B aortic dissection, challenges of progressive symptoms in the retrograde dissection, after which a comment will be made by Dr. Rana Fifi. I would like to thank the committee for allowing me to uh, access to the privilege of the virtual podium. We have no disclosures. Our patient is a 70 year old man with a history of hurt who is a never smoker. Uh, do you mind to share the slides with us? Uh, I thought it was. And if you can stay close to the microphone because the voice is in and out, so thank you. Okay, we can see your slides. Uh, I would like to thank the program organizers for giving me the privilege of the virtual podium. We have no disclosure. Our patient is a 70 year old man with a history of hypertension and GERD who is a never smoker. He presented to the outside hospital for tearing back pain and gastric pain. He also had dizziness and bilateral lower extremity paresthesias. A CTA was performed, which showed a narrowing of the anterior aortic arch and moderate dilatation of the posterior aortic arch and descending thoracic aorta up to 5.6 centimeters. He had a dissection starting just distal to the origin of the subclavian artery and terminated proximal to the celiac trunk. He was transferred to our hospital for concerns for coarctation of the aorta. He had been started on an esmolol drip and then transitioned to a labetalol drip and admitted to acute status as his symptoms had resolved. The measurements were done on the fine cut CTA in anticipation of future repair. It was decided that he would receive intervention at two to four weeks unless pain worsened or we were unable to control the dissection. However, he returned to the hospital a week later as his symptoms had returned with tearing pain in his chest. A CTA was performed at this time, which showed a periapicial hematoma proximal to the dissection and the aneurysmal dilatation was now six centimeters. Previously, it was 5.6 centimeters. There was also concern for a left-sided pleural effusion, which was just a simple effusion. Due to concern for impending rupture, and as he had suitable anatomy, we planned for a thoracic endovascular repair, but obtained consent 
for a possible left carotid subclavian bypass as well. Neurosurgery had been consulted to place the spinal drain as there was a possibility we may need to cover the aorta down to the spinal axis, and as such, we may cover the artery of Adamkowicz and cause it to record syndrome. Percutaneous bilateral femoral axis was performed to find the wires in the true limit and the transfer of the channel of view. The measurements have been pre-selected on fine cut CTA and IVIS for uh, obtaining proper measurements. A conformable core tag device is used for the best steel zone as that allowed for maneuverability to conform with the angle of the neck. Given the wide osteum of the left subclavian artery, we opted to encroach the bare metal struts into the origin of the subclavian, as this would allow for a seal to close the proximal section up. And it was large enough to obviate the need for a conrotted subclavian bypass. We then placed another 31 by 20 centimeter extension with a five centimeter overlap. However, after placement, there was a small delay seen in the false movement below the celiac axis. We opted not to cover further into the visceral vessels as the proximal seal zone was covered and we did not want to cover the artery of the dental The patient was doing well and we always have the opportunity to delay and take the procedure should he require it. The rest of the hospital course was uncomplicated. The spinal drain was kept in for 48 hours and clamps, then clamped for 12 hours and then removed. His symptoms had all completely resolved and he was ultimately discharged home. He was seen back in clinic for a one month follow-up and he still has some flow in the false lumen. However, he has a good proximal seal and no further symptoms. This is a slide from Dr. Lombardi's presentation that depicts the main points about uh, type B aortic dissections. TBADs can be characterized by hyperacute, acute, subacute, and chronic based on the onset of symptoms. The general consensus is when these are uncomplicated, Medical therapy with beta blockers are needed to reduce the aortic wall stress and to reduce the pressure in the false lumen. However, 25 to 30% of uncomplicated TBADs can progress to a complicated state. The signs and symptoms of complicated ones include aortic rupture, refractory pain, rapid aortic expansion, uncontrollable hypertension, malperfusion of the visceral vessels, or readmission. TVAR is also, a, is also superior to open surgical repair due to increased risks of paraplegia and stroke with the latter. For sake of brevity, I will not go through all of the nuances of these trials. However, briefly, the INSTEAD trial showed that in the setting of clinically stable, uncomplicated type B aortic dissection, elective stent graft placement and optimal medical management allows for increased aortic remodeling. However, there is not an improvement in survival or adverse events after two years. The INSTEAD XL trial showed that there was a 19.1% absolute risk reduction in the TVAR group with a decrease in aorta specific mortality. The ADSORB trial showed that there is an increased remodeling of the aorta with thrombosis of the false lumen and reduction of the diameter of the false lumen induced by the stent graft and the medical therapy did have failures which required intervention. There are other trials currently underway for further management of these dissections, such as the VIRTUE trial and the INTACT AD trial. The timing of the repair is the main question. The guidelines recommend against repair of acute uncomplicated type B aortic dissections in the first two weeks there is a risk of retrograde type A aortic dissection, which carries a high mortality rate and the need for open aortic surgery or aer for aortic rupture. This may be due to the aortic dissection membrane being vul too vulnerable at this time. The risk increases based on the location of the proximal seal zone, whether the right carotid or the right subclavian are covered. There is also co correlation with the dilatation of the aortic root and risk of retrograde type A aortic dissection. 
Interestingly, 40% of patients with type B defections have a dilated ascending aorta. The aorta continues to remodel for at least three months and the literature shows less success with interventions performed after three months. TVAR is also now the gold standard for complicated type B aortic defections. Our patient was initially in the uncomplicated group. However, because of his readmission, worsening pain and signs of impending rupture on the CTA, he was moved into a complicated group and thus the TVAR was performed. He was seen in clinic for his one month follow-up. There has been no change in the aortic diameter. And there is, however, there's not full thrombosis of the fall of lumen. However, there's a good proximal seal. He will get a repeat CTA in three months. So in conclusion, uh, initial treatment of uncomplicated type B aortic dissection is medical management. TVAR can be performed in the subacute phase. TVAR in the acute phase should be reserved for complicated type B aortic dissection or rupture. The risk of retrograde type A dissection is the most feared complication of interviewing, intervening in the acute phase. Further studies are needed for long-term sequela of treatment for TVAR versus optimal medical therapy. And also, the TVAR itself is not a cure, and follow-up with the surgeon is needed for surveillance of the false lumen and possibly for aneurysmal degeneration. Thank you. Um, thank you for the great presentation and um, the nice and a great outcome kind of saved with that patient. Um, a few comments and questions, actually, because I this is a little bit more unique than just a regular dissection patient. I think that maybe I would, I'm interested in seeing what were your technical consideration for the fact that there was a coarctation here, so the measurements are different. So what? how did you take that into account, measuring which stent graft to use? Um, and then usually when we take care of those kind of coarctation, you would want to balloon it versus not ballooning in dissection. So I'm curious as to how did you manage that in this specific case? Or just text me. Can you hear? We can't hear. Um, maybe you're muted and. So maybe you can try again because we couldn't hear um, what you were saying. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, now we can hear you. So um, I'll repeat the, the question. The question was, what was your tech, how did you take under consideration measurements of the stent graft, which one you used, especially with the presence of a coarctation uh, and a narrower area in the landing zone, approximately? Second, uh, in coarctation, usually you would want to do an aortic balloon, and you want to do the ballooning at that segment versus in dissection, you don't. So I'm curious in this case if you had used that at all. Um, that's one. Um, and then I will add another question as far as um, when you discharged the, the patient the first time, what was the status as far as blood pressure control? What were the recommendation as far as activity and blood pressure control? Do, did you make sure, do you think that the patient understood that or was compliant with those recommendations? So I will answer the second question first. Uh, when we discharged the patient initially, he had reported that all of his symptoms had resolved. Now, this patient had initially thought that his symptoms were due to his, uh, his acid reflux, his GERD that he has been suffering with for a while. And as a result, uh, we, uh, when he reported that his symptoms were all completely gone, uh, we felt that, uh, that this showed that he did not necessarily meet indications for treatment. Uh, we did speak to him just you know, regarding the need for keeping his blood pressure under control. So we were opting for optimal medical therapy. Um, in terms of the uh, in terms of the sec uh, first question, which is asked, we used the uh, the Gore Tag balloon. Oh, sorry, the Gore Tag stent. 
because of the angled neck. And we wanted to ensure that we were be able to uh, get a good seal and also um, we did not use a balloon for this. You, I can comment further. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, sorry. It's all right. I can comment. Um, yes, it's, it's my case. So essentially, um, the concern was that it may be coarctation, but in the 3D reconstruction, um, it didn't, it appeared to unfold sufficiently to allow what we thought would be able to, would seal with a C tag or conformable tag device. Um, we went in there anticipating that if I couldn't get a seal, we would perform a carotid subclavian bypass and then put a proximal cuff. And obviously in a dissection, we opted not to balloon and we decided that after we deployed the device, once we thought we had an adequate seal. And at the time it discharged, his blood pressure was well controlled. Uh, Alan, uh, do you have any, um, um, any comments for this case? Yeah, again, nice job. Um, it's interesting that you showed the, the classification, which I think is ludicrous, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, we, we classify these things really to make it easy to report cases and have some sort of classification symptom. But the idea that on midnight of the stroke of the 13th day, it suddenly moves from being acute into subacute doesn't make any biological sense to me whatsoever. And these are designed for people who want to write clinical trials and actually and put things in. So we've been much more interested in biological markers. And, and by biological markers, you know, one, for example, is that I actually believe we presented this at Dr. Veith's meeting for the first time, and that was septal motion. We've known for a long time that you can operate, you know, once you get to two or three weeks because the wall thickens up. And fundamentally, we think the same thing happens with the septum. And that's really what makes this safer to do at that point in time. But the idea that um, the biology is dictated by midnight on the 13th day doesn't really make a whole lot of biological sense to me. And so that's one of the reasons we use dynamic imaging in this to try and see if we can look at septal motion and use that as some sort of surrogate marker for chronicity. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Veith, uh, any comments? Yeah, it was a nice case, nice presentation. I think the critical part of this case, or critical factor, is how you measure uh, and size the, uh, the endograph that you're going to put in. Because if you put in too big an endograph, uh, the possibility of retrograde dissection is increased. So would you just outline clearly what how you make your measurements for the proximal, at the proximal uh, side of the endograph and how you size it. So in this case, uh, initially the measurements were done using the fine cut CT scans. However, we also used IVIS to remeasure and It's very hard to hear you. I, I don't know why. Uh, we also used IVIS to redetermine the interluminal measurements so that we could adequately size our graft and ensure that we get uh, adequate uh, luminal diameter for the aorta itself. Uh, thank you. So we're going to go into the uh, uh, third case is uh, Dr. Uh, Carmour. Uh, with the supervising faculty, Dr. Orny White. Uh, the case is going to be complex uh, TIVA repair followed by uh, visceral debranching and uh, flip uh, EVAR. Dr. Carmour? Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present here today. My name is Amit Parmour. I'm a doctor surgery fellow at Harvard UCLA Medical Center in California. Today's case is one of a complex aortic dissection repair with hybrid visceral debranching and false lumen intentional placement of a bifurcated endograft. I have no disclosures. 
Um, so <clears throat> the case is of a 46 year old woman who presented with uh, chest, abdominal and back pain. She had a prior type B aortic dissection, which was repaired with a zone two T-VAR um, after a uh, carotid to subclavian transposition um, at an outside hospital. She had prohibitive uh, medical comorbidities, including um, congestive heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. Um, here is her presenting CTA. And what it will demonstrate is that her prior T-VAR did not have um, any endo leaks. There was a um, thora uh, thoracoabdominal uh, aortic aneurysm with uh, degeneration up to six centimeters, a severely compressed true lumen there, as you can see, um, as small as 10 millimeters, and a left common iliac artery aneurysm measuring about 3.5 centimeters. Uh, of note, there were uh, several large fenestrations, most notably at the celiac um, uh, artery level, as well as the aortic bifurcation. Here is a 3D reconstruction of um, her CTA. And so really this case um, was all about planning. Um, her medical comorbidities prohibited her from an open uh, thoracoabdominal um, replacement. And our decision-making was to perform and a hybrid approach to the problem with uh, open um, abdominal uh, debranching followed by an endovascular repair um, with a modified false lumen in, uh, intentional placement of a bifurcated graft into the um, false lumen via the fenestrations. Um, so the open portion of the operation, um, which was performed first, included a custom-made Dacron trifurcated graft with an additional limb to the SMA. Uh, the right common iliac artery was chosen as the inflow and the um, anastomosis was performed as distal as possible to allow an adequate length seal zone of that right common iliac artery for the um, uh, EVAR limb. The endovascular portion was then performed in a stage fashion a couple days later with um, uh, placement of uh, lumbar spinal drainage um, for protection. Here is a schematic um, a representation of um, the endovascular procedure, which I'll uh, describe next. As you can see, the green um, line there demonstrates true lumen access through, through and through um, via the right, um, uh, right femoral and iliac artery into the T-VAR. However, on the left, um, the true lumen access was obtained via the fenestrations and the yellow line there demonstrates the portion of the wire and subsequently the endograph that would be pl eventually placed into the false lumen. So the operation was performed percutaneously via bilateral groin access. And again, uh, both true and false lumen wires were placed um, in as uh, was described earlier. The endograft was, the main body of the endograft was deployed via the right, um, uh, the right side and the right wire. Um, the, uh, the sheath had to be, um, as you can imagine with the 18 French sheath, it had to be retracted um, to just distal to the um, uh, visceral uh, debranching graft to maintain perfusion to the viscera. And in um, uh, deploying the extension limbs and obtaining uh, access to the gate, um, it was noted that uh, the graft could not be, the limb could not be extended across the fenestration. Therefore, balloon angioplasty had to be performed of the fenestration with an obvious waist. Uh, followed by subsequent deployment of the um, uh, iliac limbs. The internal iliac artery on the left side was sub uh, 
uh, coil embolized prior to the extension, which uh, eventually went into the external iliac artery to exclude the common iliac artery aneurysm on that side. Here is um, the completion angiogram. Uh, this is the proximal segment, does not demonstrate any sort of type three endo leak. Um, the viscera maintained perfusion. And here is the distal um, uh, completion angiogram, which again, no uh, type one B endo leak and the visceral uh, arteries do have a perfusion. Um, the patient was subsequently uh, discharged and has been uh, serially followed at two years. Her CTA demonstrates uh, complete um, thrombosis of her false lumen without any sort of endo leaks and um, a regression of her thoracoabdominal aneurysm from six centimeters to five centimeters. Her left common iliac artery aneurysm is stable in size at two years at 3.5 centimeters. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity once again. Uh, thank you, Dr. Carmel. We're going to have uh, Dr. Jason Lee uh, comment and uh, ask some questions. Great, thank you. Um, appreciate the opportunity to participate. Very exciting cases thus far. Congratulations uh, to, to Amit and the, uh, the team in Los Angeles on, on a great case. A uh, couple of uh, uh, questions. How long did you wait between the debranching and doing the modified flip uh, endograft extension? That's question number one. And then question number two, um, I'm curious about the intentional placement of the contra limb in the false lumen. Why not just stay in the true lumen, deploy everything, cannulate, and then balloon, balloon tear because above and below, you would just be in the same continuity. It seems like a lot of effort to maneuver in and out of true and false lumens. Um, why not just do everything in the true lumen? Um, well, let me answer your uh, first question first. Uh, the patient eventually uh, went on to have the endovascular portion of the stage repair, the same hospitalization, and it was only um, uh, three days um, allowed in between the operations. Um, this was felt because the patient was symptomatic that um, there was a certain level of urgency with the um, repair. As far as your second question, um, why not stay true lumen for the entire operation? I think, you know, when you look at the CTA uh, closely, the true lumen was very compressed and there was concern that perhaps uh, we may not get a uh, adequate expansion, um, which may compromise uh, eventual uh, gate cannulation, et cetera. Um, and therefore, we thought that with the use of IVIS, um, it might uh, be and which was easier to perform the operation as we did. Great. I, I, you know, I think um, we put together a registry about seven or eight years ago on sort of the North American experience with with debranching. And it turned out a lot of patients um, never have their second stage. Um, it's such a big operation to recover from, despite best plans to bring them back in three to seven days to do part two. A lot of them have other abdominal complications from the debranching. Went home with best intentions to come back in a few weeks uh, for the EVAR TVAR and never showed up again. A personal experience. We've, we've noticed that. So I, so I agree with the idea of trying to keep them in house. And if you will, almost on the day of discharge, meaning when they're stable enough to be discharged home, proceeding uh, with the, uh, with the T-bar part of it. I still think the, the sort of intentionally getting it open into the false lumen and then creating more room for that. It, it still seems like there's a lot of maneuvering. You, you, you know, you wind up going in true, false, true, false, before you get into the gate. And I just having deployed enough bifurcated devices inside of a compressed true lumen and watching it slowly expand right in front of you. I think the septum perhaps is a little more mobile than we might give it credit for. And honestly, after you wire it, 
if you have covered stents through that area, you can just balloon tear it, knowing that you've got a covered stent graft to direct the blood flow in the correct manner. So, great case. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I would like to see if uh, Dr. Rodney White is online. Uh, Rod are you online? We cannot see you. And we cannot hear you. Um, okay, until uh, I know that he's online, but we cannot hear him. Uh, Dr. Vith, any comments? Well, uh, first of all, uh, Jason expressed some of the comments that I was going to make, but it is a great case. You can't argue with success. I would say that in most centers, Debranching is a bad operation. It is a high mortality. The second stage doesn't get done. Uh, and in places where I've been as well as others, uh, it's really uh, not a good procedure. Obviously, in your hands and with Quinonis Baldrich, they do it very well. The results are good. Uh, but I would say that's the exception rather than the rule. But again, you can't argue with success and you were successful. I would have also put the... Uh, the graft in the true lumen and 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 try to uh, not do the flip procedure. I would agree with you. Actually, we don't do any more abdominal debranching because we do consider it uh, still a large operation, especially getting all the inflow from uh, an external iliac. So um, we don't really uh, do this anymore. Uh, but that was a great case. Uh, we're going to move on into the next one, uh, Palma. Thanks, Ron and Rania. And I don't see Rod, and we're not sure why. So, uh, I mean, you did a good job without Rod on the on the line with you, <laughs> supporting you. So, way to go. Uh, thank you. The next uh, discussion will be uh, Dr. Lizzie George. She'll be presenting, just in the nick of time, the importance of surveillance in aortic dissection management. Thank you for the opportunity to present a case from our institution. We have no financial conflicts of interest to report. Oops. The back side. This is a case presentation of a 60 year old gentleman with a history of hyperlipidemia, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, prior TIA, and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation on Coumadin, as well as a prior type A dissection and subsequent repair who ultimately developed severe aortic insufficiency and arch aneurysmal degeneration. Our cardiac surgery colleagues performed a redo aortic and total arch replacement with a biologic valve sewn into a 28 Dacron that was then sewn into a 24 millimeter branch graft and a 20 millimeter elephant trunk with a 28 by 10 Gorsi tag endograft was placed in an anti-grade fashion as has been discussed previously during this conference. That was performed in October of 2019. He was being seen regularly in cardiac surgery clinic to monitor his residual dissected aorta. From immediate post-op from his reduced sternotomy in November 2019, which is on the left, to March 2020, which is on the right, the distal descending aorta only slightly increased in size from 4.6 to 4.8 centimeters in diameter, but there was an increase in the amount of filling of the false lumen over time. These are both in the same phase. Six months later, in September 2020, his descending thoracic aneurysm measured seven centimeters, growing more than two centimeters in six months. Given that this would be his third open aortic procedure, he was referred to our vascular surgery clinic that month to discuss endovascular options. We hatched a plan to perform a cheese wire fenestration of the septum to create a supraceliac distal landing zone, and then distally extend the T-bar with a 37 gore c tag device. During preoperative planning, we took note of and planned around several large intercostals as part of our efforts to balance the need for an adequate seal zone with reducing the risk of paraplegia. A lumbar drain was placed prior to the uh, in the OR before proceeding. We obtained sheath access to the bilateral common femoral arteries and selected the false lumen at the level of the uh, proximal left common iliac artery, where we knew there was already a, a large fenestration. We advanced this to the level of the aneurysm at the diaphragmatic hiatus in exchange for a seven French uh, 70 centimeter ansel sheath over rosen wire. We then double punctured the gore dry seal on the right side and advanced an omniflush catheter and performed an aortogram demonstrating our sheath from the right to be in the true lumen and our catheter on the left to be in the false lumen. This is also confirmed via IVIS. We imaged in a steep LAO to identify a large number of lumbar branches that we intended to preserve as well as the celiac artery and marked out our intended seal zone. 
about three centimeters above that intercostal. Next, we advanced an eight and a half pore guide sheath from a double puncture on the right and utilized an outback reentry device to puncture the septum and advance an 014 BMW wire into the false movement from the true. We advanced a quick cross catheter into the false lumen and exchanged to a glide wire and utilized a snare catheter from our left axis to establish a through and through wire. Having established this through wire access, we again, we again confirmed wire location in both the true and false lumens, made corresponding neck measurements, and double checked the location of the celiac and intercostal band branches via DSA and IBIS. We then utilized tension along the, uh, the wire and withdrew our sheaths in order to uh, create a fet to fenestrate the septum via sawing back and forth motion using the through wire and the sheaths as we withdrew backwards. At this point, we re-imaged and noted adequate septotomy with increased false lumen filling, and thus proceeded to deploy two Gorsi type devices, first a 37 by 15 distally and a 37 by 10 proximally, further into the elephant trunk, and used active control to decrease the bird, bird beaking and smooth the sharp angulation from the elephant trunk and the T-bar. Completion imaging revealed a preserved intercostal at T11 and no false lumen filling, ante or retrograde. Despite this extension, his routine follow-up CT angio in March of 2021 showed a type 1B endoleak, an increased feeling of, feeling of the thoracic aortic aneurysm false lumen, associated with increased aneurysmal degeneration, now measuring eight centimeters in diameter, growing another centimeter over the past month, or over the past six months. Comparing immediately post-op in September to March of this year, you can see increased filling of the false lumen and the seal zone that we had previously created with the cheese wire fenestrated. Uh, with the cheese wire fenestration had degenerated. The aneurysm had, itself had grown from seven centimeters on the left to eight centimeters on the right in six months. And again, coronal and sagittal views demonstrated a type 1B endoleak with some concern for cephalad migration of the endograph as the, as the landing zone degenerated. We discussed with the patient the need for reoperation for distal extension to halt sac expansion, and he wished to proceed. Our practice pattern is for patients to be admitted the night prior to surgery for IV hydration. He was asymptomatic, but in retrospect, he had some subjective fevers. He was taken to the preoperative holding area about 9.30 in that, mo that morning. While he was there, he developed acute 10 out of 10 left back pain associated with tachycardia and hypotension. Chest x-ray demonstrated increased opacification of the left lung fields. All signs were pointing to that he ruptured in the pre-op area. He received a liter of Normasol and 250 of albumin in order to maintain, maintain his mentation, and then he was taken to the OR emergently for T-bar. As soon as access to the vessel was obtained and a wire was placed in the descending thoracic aorta, anesthesia was induced. We expeditiously upsized our right groin access, selectively catheterized the prior T-bar device and performed an aortogram that demonstrated filling of the false lumen originating from the most distal aspect of the previously placed engraft. We then deployed a 38 by 117 zenith alpha thoracic endograft to distally extend, seal off the endoleak and exclude the aneurysm. After balloon molding with a trilobe balloon distally and proximally for seal, there was no significant type 1B endoleak that we could appreciate. After this, his hemodynamics markedly improved. We did, however, see a small bird beak, as you can see there, at the new, at dis, at the new distal endograft, and elected to extend more distally to just above the celiac artery to provide the most durable and solid repair. We marked the celiac artery via angiography and deployed a 40 by 117 zenith alpha thoracic endograft and balloon molded it to further exclude the false lumen and extend the distal seal. Completion aortogram here demonstrated no type 1B endoleak and no uh, evidence of extravasation. Appropriate filling of the visceral vessels was seen and he woke up without any neurologic deficits and he was admitted to the CDICU. Post-op CTA here demonstrated an intact distal T-bar extension to the supraceliac aorta without any evidence of persistent endoleak, as well as a large volume left hemothorax, for which the patient ultimately underwent uh, a left bats washout and door cost of the tube placement. He was discharged to rehab after a two week hospital stay. We saw the patient back in clinic in April and he had since been discharged home from rehab. His one month follow-up scan demonstrated excellent seal without evidence of endoleak. We'll see that patient back in clinic with a repeat CTA in six months. And as we saw in this case, 
surveillance imaging and the management of acute uh, and the management of aortic dissections is key. And for this patient, it was just in the nick of time that he got this. I'd like to, uh, Dr. Crazier to comment. Um, Dr. Crazier is going to uh, comment on this case. Yeah, this is a fascinating case. Congratulations uh, on excellent result. Uh, actually, uh, I'm glad to see a, a complication here and how you resolve it other than showing only beautiful results uh, and magic. So uh, do you think that any uh, thing that you did during that seesaw procedure for the septation had anything to do with that rupture? It's unlikely, but I just wanted to hear your comment. Yeah, the, I, you know, I think the, the cheese wire fenestration thing, um, folks have written about it. And in fact, uh, we have a couple papers, uh, Mike Dick and I had kind of um, clarified the technique in the way that we've done it. Um, there, there probably was some hidden intimal injury that makes it susceptible long-term. A couple things we've learned. You wanna do your tearing at a, some distance away from where you're sealing. And perhaps on this one, uh, in retrospect, because the rupture was basically about six months later. There was probably some injury degeneration. We got a little too close to the seal zone. So I, I think that's an appropriate uh, concern of these techniques where we're basically ripping the septum. Uh, you know, as we all know, open operatively, we would have a pair of scissors. It'd be a very controlled way to um, create a new lumen. But here, when you're trying to do it from an endovascular approach, you're kind of guessing how it tears. Uh, I, I just spoke to Juan Perotti last week. Juan's working on a septal cutter that goes uh, against the blood flow, you know, uh, retrograde as a way to uh, make the cut in the septum slightly more controlled. Uh, I think as many of the folks in the audience that have cut septums when it's been opened up, um, it's, it's hard to replicate a pair of scissors, if you will. Uh, when you have the whole aorta open, but I think those are the those are appropriate concerns about the technique that it probably weakens things. All that being said, we've had a lot of really nice results cutting the septum endovascularly to create an adequate landing zone for a TVAR or a proximal EVAR. So, uh, just to add on your comment, Jason, uh, Juan Parodi has uh, this experimental device. I think it's in early stages at Herman Memorial. With, uh, he uses radio frequency actually to uh, do the septation and uh, so there is no uh, pulling and stretching and uh, probably lower risk of uh, rupture uh, with this technique. Do you want to comment on it? Sure. I mean, it's still, unfortunately, all the bureaucracy of starting the, the trials are still there, but based on what I know from the technology, it is going to be the closest thing to mimic scissors as far as cutting the the, the septum from the inside, it is something that basically based on heat and so eventually it'll cut and seal as it goes, so the bleeding risk is also low. So it is supposed to be a very promising device for that and I'm hoping that soon once we start it as the trials and you know, we can start moving because at least in animals or in tissue, they start it demonstrated uh, that it's gonna be a very promising device. Um, and then maybe just a question about it here. He's a 60 year old man and I think the aneurysm has kind of grew very quick and very fast. Was there any consideration for genetic, underlying genetic disorder? Was he tested for it? And was there any contraindication for open repair in this person, in this patient? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, um, Mike Fishbein, who's our, who's our cardiac surgery partner here, super aggressive about open thoracos. Um, uh, he, the patient had just still just been recovering you know, over six months from his uh, redo um, arch um, and um, uh, sternotomy and frozen elephant trunk. Um, we had sent him for genetic testing. It turned out all negative, uh, but I think that was a heavy consideration. And in fact, he was recommended to undergo redo thoracoabdominal. Uh, thoraco um, and, and perhaps like a lot of patients who educate themselves and, and ask different options, this was a 
a, a team approach to where we came up with, uh, we would try this uh, distal T-bar landing zone uh, thing. It didn't bounce in his favor, but arguably then the second procedure to seal the rupture. Now we're um, you know several months out uh, uh, from that. We've been fortunate, uh, but yes, yeah, still it highlights the idea of surveillance, informed consent with discussions, and then uh, you know something that Alan Lumsden and I have talked about over the years. You have to have a team approach to this. You, you, you can't have a one-size-fits-all approach to these complex thoracoabdominals. You have to have expertise on, on options, open and endo, and provide that to the patient and make a best recommendation. It's a great point. So Jason, one more comment and maybe a, a question that you can answer. I have had a pretty good experience uh, in patients that have a persistent flow in a false lumen an enlargement of the false lumen over a period of time without remodeling, uh, doing coil embolization, extensive coil embolization, sometimes even in stages all the way down to the celiac with very good results, preventing catastrophes like this. You want to comment? Uh, what is your experience in this particular area? Yeah, we've been, we've been less aggressive with uh, uh, coil embolization. We've, we've done a handful of the candy plug technique where you you modify some limb and you close it off and you stuff it in there. I think they all fall under the context of how to manage the false lumen in chronic distal dissections. And I think we need, probably we need a registry, if you will, of outcomes um, to know what works and what doesn't work. I, I think that's a moving target. Um, and, um, I, and, I, and I always look forward to hearing what other folks and how other folks uh, have approached it. I think these are great techniques and ideas balloon septal rupture, uh, coil embolization, candy plug, uh, knickerbocker. I mean, a bunch of different ways to deal with the, the persistent false lumen. Uh, an entire meeting we could have about uh, dealing with the false lumen. One minute and maybe uh, Dr. White or uh, Dr. Vith can just uh, comment on the case. Yeah, I have a comment. Uh, the uh, cheese cutter uh, septotomy is not a good procedure even though it, I guess, worked pretty well here, because uh, some cases of prolapse of the septum have been, uh, of the cut septum have been described, which is a catastrophic complication. And the so-called Perotti device is not the Perotti device, it's the Berger, Ramon Berger Perotti device. Ramon Berger uh, got collaboration from Perotti, and he's really the sort of the father figure for this device, which I think has some promise because it cuts the septum from below up uh, and, and prevents the prolapse complication. We'll hear more about it. Still worry about that false lumen dilating after you do that, but- Of course. They're, they're, they're saying that outer wall has got significant strength in it, but I- Well, they're, they're, it doesn't the make old sense. Mel Williams concept of creating- right dividing the septum and, and showing that the false lumen, the wall does have uh, some strength. And after all, that's the wall we end up with in carotid endarterectomies and aortic endarterectomies. So maybe they're uh, right. I'm not sure it's the same though. We're not sure either. Yeah. This is um, from uh, Michael Harms from uh, Texas Heart Institute, a case of uh, EVAR migration. And uh, we're going to have uh, Rodney White uh, comment after the case. Uh, as Dr. Provenza said, I'm Michael Harms. I'm one of the cardiology fellows at uh, Texas Heart Institute. Uh, I'm honored to be here. And as you'll see through my presentation, we're kind of continuing the theme of the importance of surveillance. Um, so, uh, in this case, this uh, was a 61-year-old gentleman uh, who was sent to our institution with severe back and abdominal pain. And saliently, he had a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, coronary artery disease, status post coronary artery bypass graft, uh, cardiomyopathy with a history of heart transplant about five years ago. And then uh, pertinent to this discussion, three years prior to this presentation, he had an EVAR at our institution. Um, unfortunately, uh, despite several attempts to contact the patient, he had failed to return to our institution for any form of follow-up and was not receiving adequate follow-up in the periphery. 
uh, on admission, uh, his blood pressure was 98 over 60, his heart rate was 110. Uh, his abdomen was tender and distended, he had normal bowel sounds, and he had a large pulsatile aorta. Uh, his hemoglobin was 8.2, uh, mild leukocytosis, and renal insufficiency. Uh, this is the CT from the outside hospital for this presentation with the prior EVAR, uh, basically notable for this uh, massive rupture AAA uh, with associated uh, retroperitoneal hematoma. And in these images, uh, the important features are the um, abdominal aorta diameter at the renal artery as well as the very uh, large ruptured abdominal aorta uh, more distally and the migrated stent graft. Uh, notably, it was about 14 centimeters uh, in terms of the actual size of the aorta and rupture at this point. As reference, uh, these are his images from his initial procedure or prior to his initial procedure with some of the measurements. Uh, at that time, his neck diameter had been 23 millimeters. The neck length was between 23 to 40 uh, millimeters, as we'll see on some of the other imaging. And the maximum diameter was 60 uh, by 58 millimeters. Uh, these were the uh, pictures from our hybrid suite on the initial procedures. Um, what you can note um, that's relevant to this discussion on the image to the right here is he has a left uh, renal accessory artery, uh, which was preserved during our initial procedure. It was thought that that was actually perfusing a substantial portion of the left um, kidney. Um, and the measurements are here uh, between the left renal accessory and the kind of length of the neck uh, was thought to be about 23 millimeters was thought to be adequate for a seal zone. For the initial procedure, uh, it was uncomplicated. Uh, we used ProStars for the percutane uh, percutaneous repairs. He had a 12 and 18 French sheets place. We used a Gore excluder, 28.5 uh, by 14.5 by 160, and a uh, Contra 20 by 115. Uh, and this was the completion of the angiogram uh, after his first procedure. And you can see that the left renal accessory is preserved in these images. So we uh, landed just beneath that. Uh, it was an uneventful procedure. He discharged uh, post-op day one. Uh, and this brings us back to his recent presentation. Uh, and so what you can see in these images is the migration of the stent graft, obviously more distally, um, and the massively uh, enlarged abdominal uh, aortic aneurysm with rupture. So in the second procedure, uh, the left renal accessory artery was actually coil embolized to allow ourselves more purchase for a seal zone. Uh, the right and left renals were selectively cannulated and engaged as well as part of uh, periprocedural planning. And ultimately, uh, we were able to do a redo EVAR with a 28 millimeter by 14.5 by 14 centimeter excluder bifurcated stent graft. Uh, which was deployed via primary right FA access, and we did a 14.5 by 14 contra limb. And this was the completion angiogram following the second procedure. And again, for reference, you can now see the coils and the uh, accessory renal there, which has um, now been covered by the stent graft. Uh, the teaching points we hope to highlight in this case was effectively that surveillance post EVAR is important to avoid complications, particularly for patients who have had complex anatomy or comorbid conditions. Uh, the endograft migration and type 1A endoleak usually lead to serious complication. Uh, however, ruptured AAAs can be successfully, uh, successfully treated with a percutaneous approach and local anesthesia. And then to kind of open the floor to what caused the endograft, mig uh, endograft migration in this case, uh, was it the loss of the structural integrity? Was it a diseased aortic wall, uh, neck dilation? And to highlight the idea to obtain as much seal zone as possible and to ask the question, would a different endograft with a separate uh, fixation and seal zone or super renal fixation perhaps have served this particular context better? And with that, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Krasier uh, for helping me with this case review and this presentation. Uh, Dr. White, 
Can you? Um, yeah, I'm glad I glad I got connected here to be able to talk about Dronko's complication. Although I don't know what they did wrong, because um, it looked fine. Did he have CTs after that first procedure of when? So the, or was this three, just showed up three years later because maybe uh, there was a type one or something? You know, so some time ago, he may have had his first 30-day CT, but certainly thereafter, we didn't have any imaging on him despite multiple attempts to contact him, the referring cardiologist. <laughs> and so he kind of um, re represented to our institution after a three-year absence, uh, kind of hot with this ruptured AAA uh, with no real interval imaging. Do you know at that 30 day if there was a type one or some evidence? Because otherwise, that's very disappointing. You had plenty of neck and yeah, I, it looks I, like it was sized right. So, yeah, and to uh, in, in, in fairness, I'm actually not 100% sure he even obtained that scan. I just know for certain he did not obtain any scans thereafter. And so, in that scan, when it's not completed our institution and was not available for our review either. And so, it was a bit of um, the dilemma was certainly partially the lack of surveillance um, because we, you know, in, in terms of thinking about things and risk factors in terms of seal zone, angulation, uh, calcifications, you know, neck diameter, he didn't seem like someone who was going to for certain behave this way. And so we agree with that. Yeah, and you had a 23 millimeter neck to start with. So right. that's certainly within an IFU that, you know, you wouldn't get criticized for otherwise, so. Well, I don't have any way to speculate why it went unless it was a type one that got missed and then it came down. But even with that, it seems like he had an adequate neck. So um, that's a very unusual case. It must have been neck dilatation, but otherwise, I don't know if I have any answers. So. Somebody else might speculate on what that was. But. Uh, thank you, uh, Rod. Uh, Dr. Lamston. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, you start off by saying try to get maximize the amount of seals on. I mean, just for everybody else, you look at these accessory renals, that's a big accessory renal. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody's really going to sacrifice that. Uh, but I can't remember, what was the seal zone below the accessory renal? And was it normal? Of course, it's a $60 million question. Yeah, I think it was uh, below that accessory renal, renal. It was somewhere in the order of 20 to 21. Which we'd normally think is, is more than adequate. More than adequate, yes, sir. Um, and so it, I mean, other reasons that we reported many years ago, albeit it was with a, an aneurex, which does not have active, active fixation. It was a patient who was in a car wreck, had a major deceleration injury, and we had CT scans before and after, and clearly saw that endograph move down mm -hmm. from trauma to the abdomen. So I don't know if there was anything like that that could actually explain it. But I mean, you're, you're always in a situation, if the patient's got a normal creatinine, are you better off just doing what you did up front, embolize it and extend up to the main renal arteries? Yeah, and I think that's a, a very fair question. I think, you know, retrospectively knowing what we know about this patient um, and ultimately the outcome that he had and the fact that we did embolize that accessory renal to obtain more purchase, I think, you know, that, that's certainly one option. Um, you know, again, I think it just as a case by case basis, and I don't think there's a, you know, a very clear objective or kind of a way to stratify these patients perfectly into, um, into whether you would want to sacrifice that accessory renal to obtain a couple more millimeters of purchase, or if that's someone who, with appropriate surveillance, this would have been caught earlier and managed more easily and facilely and is part of the acceptable kind of um, spectrum of patients who's going to have some degree of leak and complication that can be managed. We have also one more question for Dr. McGillivray. Yeah, thank, just a question. Uh, I mean, this patient had had a heart transplant and was on presumably the host of immunosuppressant agents. And is there any data about uh, problems associated with endovascular procedures with immunosuppressed patients? That's an excellent question. And um, I myself don't know that data personally. I'm not sure if Dr. Crazier has any experience or data to answer that, but it's certainly an interesting hypothesis. Yeah, I don't know if this had anything to do. Prednisone by itself, we know, weakens the wall. So I think he just had a deterioration of the wall integrity. And that's, but it didn't dilate. This is a puzzling thing. Typically, yeah. we see the dilatation. It was 23 millimeters 
three years prior and the remain 23 millimeters after that. So it was not a dilatation. And we routinely balloon the seal zone at the end of the procedure and there was no endo leak. So, and the, there are eight endo anchors there. They should have been embedded in, and there was no thrombus there. So the risk of uh, suboptimal seal and migration of this particular stain graft and many other ones is uh, a lot of thrombus, uh, calcium where the endo anchors cannot penetrate, and very large neck that's diseased and deteriorates rapidly. But none of those were present in this particular patient. Uh, thank you. Dr. Vith, any uh, comments on the case? Yeah, a quick one. Uh, we've been preaching EVAR for ruptured aneurysms since we did the first one in 1994. Whenever I debate this around the world, I'd lose the argument up until about three years ago. And largely that was because of three very flawed randomized trials showing no benefit to EVAR over open repair. The last three years, I've started winning the debate, so I guess... We're ignoring the randomized trial. I have Myself. seen your talks quite a few times in, during your meeting, so I know your talks inside out. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Palma, can we go into the next case? Thank you. Very good, Rania. Thank you very much. Our, our next presentation will be uh, from Dr. Travis Bowles. Difficult decision making with the focus section with the discussion afterwards by Dr. Lee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. The patient is a 53-year-old male with no significant past medical history other than methamphetamine abuse who presented to an outside hospital uh, with acute onset severe left-sided chest pain for the past two days and was diagnosed with an acute type B dissection with the left side <coughs> pneumothorax concerning for rupture. Uh, he was transferred to Methodist for a higher level of care. Per report from the outside hospital, he had several uh, vascular malformations in his head concerning uh, or several, sorry, CT findings on head concerning for vascular malformations. He was severely thrombocytopenic with a platelet count of 12 for unknown reasons, and he was being transfused four units of platelets in route. On exam, in RICU, he was hemodynamically stable on an esmolol drip. He had a benign abdominal exam. He had palpable radio and pedal pulses. He was actually pretty belligerent. He was threatening to leave uh, AMA from the ICU when he arrived. His labs were notable for AKI with a creatinine of 3.2, uh, normal LFTs, a positive UDS for uh, methamphetamine, and a white count of 14, but again, no associated abdominal pain in a benign exam, as well as a platelet count of 70 uh, after four units. Because he was uh, stable, we went ahead and repeated his imaging upon arrival. His CT head did show several small hyperdents foci concerning for vascular malformations in several different territories. His repeat chest, abdomen, pelvis rebuild, an acute type B uh, dissection with a pretty large fenestration proximally, just distal to the left subclavian artery. Uh, it was pretty dilated to about seven, seven and a half uh, centimeters distally with a little blip there medially concerning for uh, an area of rupture. The aneurysm extended all the way to the celiac artery, but his aorta became normal in diameter at the takeoff of the SMA and renal arteries. Again, you saw the left-sided hemothorax as well concerning for rupture. Here are the sagittal views, a pretty compressed uh, true lumen and a pretty large uh, fenestration proximally and distally. We got ethics and psychiatry involved. They uh, deemed that he lacked capacity to make medical decisions. Uh, we, they recommended we discuss his care with his father and sister, which we would, did, and they agreed with our operative plan to go ahead to the operating room. Uh, hematology was consulted. They didn't see any clear, obvious source of his thrombocytopenia either. Uh, at this point, we deemed him to be a pretty poor uh, open candidate, given the AVMs in his brain and severe thrombocytopenia which was only transiently responsive to uh, platelet transfusions. And we opted for a T-VAR with possible left subclavian coverage and left carotid subclavian bypass, uh, as well as extension to the celiac artery. Uh, we transfused him a ton of platelets and convinced anesthesia to place the spinal drain preoperatively. We actually began here with the mesenteric arteriogram. We have a balloon in the celiac artery occluding it. Uh, and a catheter in the SMA, we're injecting to see whether or not the uh, collateral pathways fill the GDA and hepatic, which they did. 
At this point, we went ahead and proceeded uh, with the T-VAR and celiac artery coverage. We put a Rosen wire into the SMA since we already catheter, uh, catheterized it to hold our place in case we needed to extend distally. Uh, we could periscope a stent graft. We got right brachial artery access in hope that we could stay in the true lumen um, from this side. Here you can see our wire passing in what appears to be probably the false lumen. We have a wire from below as well, which appears to be in the collapsed true lumen. We were having trouble passing it uh, up towards the head. We ended up getting, we thought back was into the true lumen uh, and snared our wire from below in exchange for an Amplatz wire from the right brachial artery to the uh, right common femoral artery. These are uh, marks for the celiac SMA and right and left renal that we uh, fused. Here we are bringing up our IVUS catheter to confirm. Just this with the left of clavian, it appeared that we crossed into the septation and we were in the false lumen actually that you can see here. Here's a run from the left of clavian takeoff all the way down to the celiac. It appeared that we were in the true lumen at the takeoff of the left of clavian. We entered that large septation into the false lumen right there uh, in the proximal descending thoracic. But distally, it appeared that we crossed over uh, the large septation, entered the true lumen distally at the level of the celiac uh, and SMA, and renals were in the true lumen. You can see the takeoff of the celiac there, the SMA with our wire in it, and the right and left renal arteries there. So we didn't uh, put forth much effort into to recannulating the true lumen, thought because we were going from true to true that we could just stint uh, in the false lumen in between. Again, the false lumen was pretty wide. The true lumen was uh, pretty severely compressed, and the aorta was fairly tortuous. Here we are putting up our large 24-French uh, gore dry seal sheath from below. We were trying to land uh, just short of the left subclavian uh, and ballooning it approximately to see if we could get a good seal zone with plans to cover it and do a carotid subclavian in the same setting if we did not have adequate seal zone proximally. This is a 37 millimeter by 20 centimeter uh, CTAG device. We piggybacked a, a marker pig and performed an arteriogram just to confirm that our marks were correct. After partially deploying it here, I believe we recaptured it uh, and scooted it back just a hair. We then brought up a second device. I think this was a 40 millimeter by 20 centimeter device that we deployed. This is probably going from uh, the stain graph back into the true lumen distally. You can see a little bit of compression there. We ended up ballooning the entire length of the graft, even though it was a, a dissection. Uh, the septum was fairly thick, and we wanted to get a good proximal distal seal zone. This is a 45 by 20 centimeter graft distally, again covering the celiac artery, landing just short of our wire in the SMA. Uh, upon ballooning the entire length of the graft, the, the distal graft were shortened about two centimeters, so we ended up placing a second 45 centimeter by 10 centimeter, or 45 millimeter rather, uh, device distally. And there you can see it foreshortened above the celiac artery. And even though we confirmed on angiogram that we had pretty adequate seal zone distally, we went ahead and placed eight uh, aptus endo anchors so that we would not have to come back for a type 1B endo leak. On our completion run, we did have adequate seal zone proximally and distally, so we did not uh, cover the left subclavian artery or do a carotid subclavian bypass.
Uh, unfortunately, post-op, he was moving both legs. He was left intubated, of course, was moving both legs that night. At about 6 p.m. the following day, his sedation was weaned for uh, SBT, and he was not moving either leg. We got an immediate uh, CT of his head and MRI, which revealed multiple uh, bilateral acute infarcts, as well as a small right uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, MRI of the, the spine subsequently showed a distal cord infarction uh, as well. Bit of a complex situation. Given that he had uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, so we didn't want to drain too much CSF. It was blood tinged at one point. Uh, we ultimately removed it on postoperative day 10 without any functional neurological recovery of his legs. Uh, angiogram that day showed no uh, MCA, or showed a small MCA bifurcation aneurysm that looked uh, to be unruptured, no AVMs or any other aneurysms. He was ultimately discharged to an LTAC uh, about a month later. Thank you. We have Dr. Jason Lee to comment, please. Yeah, thanks, thanks for showing that case. Uh, to, to echo some of the earlier comments, it's always educational to see Complication. So appreciate uh, the group uh, showing um, an outcome that the patient survived, but obviously not what we all desire to uh, be um, to have a postoperative uh, cerebrovascular event. I just wrote down a couple of notes here. Um, very, very nicely presented. You started with the idea that maybe we want to avoid ballooning in in dissection, and then you showed that you actually did do some ballooning. Um, and I wonder if um, your thought of the postoperative um, cerebrovascular event was related to either ballooning, arch manipulation. I think you made the mention that you that you deployed it and you had to adjust it a little bit. That, as everyone knows, the active control you're you're asked to deploy it a little further, deploy it and snug it back into position. I, I've always been concerned um, that you know any arch uh, any kind of arch manipulation can lead to um, small emboli. Um, and then the third question, just because we're at, you know, Alan Lumsden's place, he always talks about, um, transcranial Doppler in the middle of these cases to see if we can detect when these events occur, do they occur during the deployment? Do they occur during the angiogram? Do they occur during the ballooning? Um, it might've been an, a useful adjunct to know when the TCD hits were happening during this case and might have been instructive so that we can all learn from this. Uh, but curious your comments on that. To, otherwise, congrats on at least getting it to seal uh, well despite the complication. Thanks again for showing the complication. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, I, I, don't, I think this case was done fairly late at night. Uh, TCD is only good, I think, till 5 p.m. Um, so we were unfortunately able not, not to get them to, uh, to help out with the case. The, the through and through wire was something we had discussed quite a bit about. Um, the aorta was fairly tortuous. We thought it would help with pushability and help us hopefully stay in the true lumen, which of course, uh, and unfortunately did not. I think to some degree having that wire through the entire case, through and through the arch, uh, as well as partially deploying, recapturing, and then deploying that T-VAR definitely uh, contributed to uh, some of these complications. We did get a CTA postoperatively. Di the dissection did not extend into the arch vessels and uh, echo intraoperatively did not reveal uh, a type A retrograde. Travis, you mean that uh, after uh, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, uh, Houston Methodist is the same like the rest of the world, right? I assume. <laughs> Alan, any comments? Yeah, it, 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 Travis said this guy was a difficult management problem, somewhat belligerent, was the understatement of the century. Um, he cussed me out at 3 o'clock in the morning and spat on our nurses and wanted to leave. And at that point, I realized. He must have been supposed to go to one of the other medical center hospitals. He surely wasn't supposed to end up in Methodist Hospital. <laughs> anyway, that was the first, first challenge. Um, to answer the point that Jason brought up, um, when you blow up that balloon, the middle cerebral artery flow velocities go through the roof. Um, even with the gore trilobe balloon, the MCA velocities go up. So I presume you do get, you know, increase in pressure inside the head when you're doing that. Whether or not that's caused this or not, I have no idea. As you know, that uh, there's a surprising instance of dissection and all the acute dissection, uh, I'm sorry, a surprising instance of stroke and all of the acute dissection trials and exactly why that seems to be a higher risk than an aneurysm. Nobody, it um, doesn't seem obvious that that would be a, a situation for us. Um, you know, his liver function test didn't bump. 
His platelet, despite the fact that his platelet count was so low, believe it or not, actually, our anesthesiologist put on the spinal drain, gave him some platelets and put the spinal drain in. So it wasn't like he was unprotected. And it was very disappointing when he had delayed paraplegia. But that's the second time we've seen this, probably in the past month, actually. So it happens, and I think it's something you've got to warn the patient. We've probably all seen it when the patient goes home. That it's a medical emergency if they have, you know, uh, if they get any change in sensation or they get paralysis, they've got to come back immediately and you've got to act on it very aggressively, but it didn't reverse it in this patient. If I may uh, <clears throat> comment, maybe, uh, and this is for all of us for the future considerations, we know that with uh, arch manipulation of any kind, uh, there is a higher incidence of embolization, uh, not just with Stengraft procedures, but TAVR and so on. So maybe in this kind of scenarios, uh, cerebral protection, such as TriGuard or whatever, might be a good idea to, to consider, right? And, so that, and another thing is, uh, I don't think we should be aggressively trying to avoid uh, distal endoleak, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, because you like to perfuse the uh, intercostals uh, when you do extensive uh, Stain graft uh, deployment, and then if there is a problem, you can later put endo anchors, particularly when you're dealing with a complex case. But anyhow, that's just my personal opinion. Well, Travis was also very nice to us in that uh, the final endo anchor we put in went <laughs> and then disappeared into <laughs> who knows where, hopefully, not the spinal cord. <laughs> Would like Dr. Beats uh, to make a comment? Yeah, I think this case points out that we're in a difficult business. You can do everything right and still get complications. I, I think, I'm not sure that the cerebral protection devices really prevent strokes. I think any time you do uh, wire manipulation in the arch, you, you could very easily get uh, strokes. And just putting in the cerebral protection devices, don't they still have strokes? Zvanko, you can tell us that. They're not totally protective, right? Vanko, I can't hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a little bit slow with the microphone. Uh, I agree with you. This was just a thought. I, I don't know. We're trying to find a solution to, for this complex problem. And I agree with you, this might not be a solution completely because as far as the cerebral protection trials are concerned for TAVR, they were not very convincing that they work right. uh, in most of the scenarios. Maybe in some selected cases they work, but definitely not in, in all of them. And actually the use of protection devices is very low, probably somewhere around 15% to 18% in the United States, so we didn't embrace it fully as a panacea for prevention of uh, cerebral emboli. A fascinating case, thank you. Thank you, Travis, great case. Uh, the last, but uh, not the least, uh, case is from uh, University of Texas. Uh, Kate Peng, she's going to talk to us for uh, autoiliac aneurysm and incidental finding in the second uh, trimester. And the discussion is going to be Dr. Lamston. All right, thank you, everybody. It's nice to join everybody. It's been a really great, um, it's been really productive, and I've been learning a lot from all these cases so far. So we'll round out the evening with this case. Um, oh, is this going? So we had a 25-year-old um, female um, at 21 weeks and two days admitted for an incidentally found infrarenal aerodiliac aneurysm. So she was actually undergoing her um, routine ultrasound, um, you know, her fetal ultrasound, and they found this, and they sent her over to us. So her past medical history, um, surgical medications, family history, really, there's really nothing that's terribly notable, um, negative alcohol, tobacco, legal substance use. Her physical exam was also pretty benign. She really had no abdominal pain. She had no palpitations, uh, no cramping, really nothing. This was pretty shocking to her. So this is her um, uh, clinic ultrasound. You know, they're expecting to find this fetus, and then here we are. We see this 4.7 by 4.8 centimeter um, aorta. Huh. 
sorry, this is not moving. And here we are, you know, as they're scanning it. Pretty surprising. So she came to the hospital, and we talked to the ob gynees and they felt like it was appropriate for her to have a CTA. So we went ahead and got a CT angiogram. Hopefully the contrast isn't too stark in this room. But you can see here, pretty healthy looking, and then boom, there we are. And I've, I've never really seen a lot of fetuses on CT, but there you are. She's, she does have a baby. <laughs> Here's her other coronal view. So you can see that pretty ugly looking thing. And finally, your sagittal view here, if I can get it to play. So pretty saccular looking. Funny looking there. So um, these are all the different sizes. Um, so her aortic neck was 12 millimeter and change. Um, aneurysm was 60. Uh, both her right and left iliac at the takeoff um, were pretty dilated um, and aneurysmal. And then they tapered down to pretty normal size. This is our 3D recon. Um, so to the right, you'll see, you know, this big aneurysm with the baby obstructing it. We took away the baby and there's your picture. Um, and this is how it looks like from the posterior view. Okay, so um, we went ahead and did some basic pre-op workup. Again, luckily she was um, not having any symptoms. She was just kind of hanging out there, um, trying to figure out what to do. Her labs were all pretty normal. Her cardiac um, studies were all pretty normal. Uh, we sent blood cultures because we were a little bit, you know, worried about the way that this looked um, on imaging, and nothing really grew out of it. So. We had a multidisciplinary conference with everybody, um, and essentially, you know, we, we talked to the patient about everything, including the fact that we really don't have a lot of literature to help guide us as to what the best thing for, for this patient is as far as management. But we planned for an EVAR, um, decided that the patient would carry the pregnancy to term. Um, in the meantime, we would perform genetic testing, and depending on what the finding is and, you know, kind of seeing how how surveillance CTs are looking, possible stent explant and an aneurysm repair after her childbirth. So um, the, uh, the operative planning started with, um, uh, we, did a, we did online fusion to help minimize radiation. Um, we went ahead and marked the bilateral renal, the bilateral iliac, and bilateral um, hypogastric ostea. And then bringing her to the operating room, we went ahead and completed the fusion. Um, with all the bony structures, with the patient's um, abdomen covered with an apron before prepping, and went ahead and did bilateral femoral access, doing pre-close, kind of the, the usual thing. Um, the, what, we, what was unique about this case, again, in, in order to try to minimize radiation, was that we actually had one of our radiologists come in, and we did this in um, conjunction with transabdominal ultrasound. Um, so we, we attempted to cannulate, um, you know, the infrarenal aortic neck and get into the descending thoracic aorta with just transabdominal ultrasound alone. Um, we use a Comfy Catherine and glide wire. That's our general workhorse. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the picture um, for this because we didn't save this uh, transabdominal ultrasound run, but you could see the wire persistently coiling into the saccular aneurysm. So we went ahead and, um, you know, used angiogram to cannulate the neck. We decreased the pulse rate to two per... Uh, two per uh, pulse per second. And here you can see, you know, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty slow, you know, it's sort of like you would move the wire and then you would, there'd be a delay and then you would see the, the wire move. Um, but you can see we're kind of having a hard time cannulating and finally we make it and there we are. Um, so we exchanged the wires for um, Lundy's, we did a sheath exchange. We elected to use um, the Gore Conform Works Cluder. Um, this was the smallest um, diameter that they have, the, the 20 by 12 by 120. Um, we oriented it extracorporeally in an anatomic fashion and went ahead and introduced it um, through the right groin. And subsequent to that, we used an IVUS catheter, which we introduced through the left groin. And you can see here, um, here we're in the aorta. You see the renal vein coming across. Oh, I might have missed it. 
We'll try again. Hold on. Is this going to work? Here. Okay. So you can see the renal artery, renal artery, IMA, and then as we're going down the IBIS, going down to the bifurcation, boom, big aortic aneurysm, and then the bifurcation, and then we're, we stopped at the hypo. So using the IBIS, we uh, marked the lowest renal artery seen on the screen. And then we partially deployed the graph, then we did a spot angiogram to ensure the graph looked good, and then we went ahead and calculated the contralateral gait. And you can see those circles, um, there's, you know, it's, uh, that's basically the fusion. It wasn't really keeping up with us, but um, it was helpful when we, were, when we were using it earlier. Then we went ahead and did a limited left iliac angio, decided, um, you know, which stent to use. We selected to use a 12 by 100, exchanged a sheath on the left, completely deployed the main body, and then we um, introduced and deployed the contralateral limb. Did the same thing on the right, selected a 10 by 70 there. And then use the coda balloon to do all the, you know, your normal um, uh, balloon dilatation, the proximal, distal, and the overlap zones. And then after this, we did a completion intravascular ultrasound. Um, unfortunately, that reel also was not saved, um, but essentially it showed that everything was patent. Um, the stents looked like they were in good position. Um, no, um, no problems there. And then after this, we had our radiologist come back and do a transabdominal ultrasound, which um, is a really cool picture, which we'll see next. And um, it showed there was no obvious type 1, 2, or 3 endo leaks. So just as orientation, um, we are looking at um, the abdomen um, with, you know, kind of axial cuts. Um, there's no, unfortunately, there's no mark, there's no, is there, no, is there a pointer here? The top one? Ooh, whoa. Whoa, okay. Um, but if you can see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here. So that, like up here, um, that's your aorta. Um, you actually don't see blood flow through it because um, of the, uh, the actual stent graft material. But you'll see that um, in this next video here, you can see it as we scan down. You can see that split into two circles, and what you'll see is that big aneurysm sac, and there's no flow into the aneurysm sac, and there's already starting to have, um, there's starting to be layers of the mural thrombus within the sac, so that's, that's a pretty cool picture and video that we were able to get. Um, so the patient did great. She was discharged post-up day two on aspirin. Um, the day after, she came in with right molar quadrant abdominal pain. Um, again, we discussed this with the ob gynees and they gave us the permission to go ahead and do a CTA, make sure all of our stents looked good. And here you can see. So we're getting there. So you'll see the renals come off nice and patent. Then you'll see our, our excluder, no type 1 endo leak, not, no type 1A. Don't see any other obvious endo leaks at all, really. Stent looks good, really no compression. You see the baby again. And then as we get to the end, you'll also see that there's no type 1B endo leak either. So ultimately, we're very happy with how this looked. Um, you know, we deemed, we, we saw her, um, we kept her for one day. Um, you know, honestly, we kind of talked about this with the ob gynees again, and it seemed like the, the baby had shifted position. You know, everything had kind of gone down to the right little quadrant, so we thought that was probably what was causing her discomfort. She was subsequently seen in clinic after her discharge. Her pregnancy is going fine. There's no complication. Um, she's currently undergoing genetic testing and workup, so um, we'll, ho we'll hopefully have those answers soon, and she is due in August, and we'll see what happens to her subsequent to that. Thank you, everybody. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I mean, I'm not sure I'd do much differently. You're, you're between a rock and a hard place. I don't think you can let that woman go to term. There's not a lot of data on pregnant women with aneurysms. The only aneurysm data I know of is uh, splenic artery aneurysms, and, and they rupture in pregnancy, and they go to about 100% fetal mortality and then about 70% right. maternal mortality. They're not going to survive a rupture from some, something like this. So right. I think you had to do that. And things that I might do differently, probably would get an MR instead of uh, a CT scan up front. I think you can do the fusion. I know you're thinking fusion. You can you can fuse an MR data set the same way as you can fuse a CT. You could have got, uh, you could have given gadolinium or furahim and got exactly the same data that you could have fused off and avoid that amount of uh, radiation. I think it is important that you, you, at some point in time, whether it's MR, you got to image her entire aorta. I mean, you got an aneurysm in one part of the aorta. I would want to see what her entire aorta looks like before this woman delivers. Uh, the next question is, how are they going to deliver? Are you going to let her go to a vaginal delivery? Is she going to get a C-section? Uh, what are the risks of both of these? Yeah, I think those are, those are really good questions. I think to address the first one about the MRI, um, you know, we actually did talk about getting an MRI instead of a CTA. And, um, you know, I, I, the, the, in, in a thorough discussion, you know, they said that really the radiation risk at this point, 21 weeks to the fetus for the CT is, is not is really not, um, it's not trivial, but it's not significant um, enough to preclude it. Um, at 21 weeks, um, the baby can actually tolerate 200 milligrays of radiation, and each CT is actually, you know, about 1.3 milligray to 35 at most, depending on how fine your cuts are. So, um, you know, I think that for, for us, having really good anatomical um, information was important. So we went ahead and just, you know, went ahead and got the CTA. Um, the second question about how we're going to let her deliver, um, you know, I, I think that is, uh, remains to be a question that is um, in discussion. I don't know if that's something that we've had further discussions about, but personally, you know, I, I worry about letting this lady, um, you know, push vaginally. There have been things in the literature where they have allowed women to have normal, you know, kind of vaginal delivery, you put an epidural, you make sure that their blood pressure is under control, um, have them experience as little pain as possible, although I don't really know how that's really possible. <laughs> but I, I think that doing a, a C-section is always, I think, a, a safe way to go for this patient. Dr. Afif, do you have any other discussions? Yeah, so we've had this discussion this morning also with, uh, with the maternal fetal medicine, because we've had the discussion. So. Um, as far as the first point, first of all, as, as far as radiation, um, we've kept it, looking at the numbers, and after 21 weeks, basically, as Kate mentioned, um, 200 is where you start thinking, but even 100 is below 100 milligrays, that absolutely no risk to the fetus. And so even though we suggested MRI, they didn't want the patient to wait. They were very anxious. Even when she came back with the pain, I said MRI. So they were following up with how much radiation she had, and they thought it was below even any risk for the fetus, so that's why they approved it. Um, we've suggested the MRI because we agree to lower it as much as possible. Um, as f and that's why also why we also opted. So for the follow-up, we're trying ultrasound and definitely MRI. I'm not putting her for, through another CT scan. We're gonna then exceed the, the amount of, of radiation. As far as delivery, as, um, as Kate said, I don't think there's a little literature, but the plan is C-section because I don't think anyone is willing to take any risks with that. Um, carrying it to term, you think about it, there were, store, there were the, the literature that exists is about cases from trauma where women had, because of trauma, either stain grafts or grafts in the abdomen ended up getting to term. Once the aorta was repaired and excluded, they were able to get the, them to term, but she's in close follow-up, so the plan is every month imaging to make sure that there is no change and no, uh, no endoleak in any way. We still don't know that she's not genetically, that she doesn't have anything genetically triggered. We're waiting for the results. That also might dictate different management, um, but we're trying at least to get to the point of 32 weeks before we make any additional decisions as long as she's stable. I mean, one other comment about great technique was you didn't show any DSA runs. You were. Normally, you do have a DSA run. You're basically doing nothing but fluoro runs to actually exactly. implant this. Now, what helped you in that is, other than getting through the annuals, it's pretty good anatomy. Mm -hmm. the, the variable here is what if there's an endoleak? And then you can get sucked into this one more run, one more run, one more right. run to try basically and fix this. Now, the good news is the anatomy above and below the annuals is pretty normal. So yeah. you probably can anticipate that you're going to have a good result from it. So it was a great case. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Vaith, any comments? 
Well, I, I have a general comment. I, I think uh, we've really seen some incredible cases. Very interesting, uh, very challenging, well done. And I, I congratulate uh, the organizers, particularly uh, Palma and Rainia, for putting this program together. I enjoyed being part of it. Thank you, Dr. Vith, and um, I would like actually to thank all of you for being here as well as uh, whoever is uh, on the web. And I would like to thank all the presenters. I think they did an excellent job, and uh, this particular uh, event was really focused for the trainees. And it's actually um, our, um, our thoughts to have some more events that we're going to have more trainees present uh, cases. And uh, as I was sitting here for the last uh, two hours, actually I got a bunch of texts that uh, how people love the format and they love the cases. So um, the plan is actually to uh, repeat that. So I would like to thank all the panelists because uh, really uh, everybody in this room and the panelists were like very, very experienced surgeons that they've been around for a long, long time. And uh, we really appreciate the fact that uh, they're able to be with us tonight and share their expertise. I would like especially to thank Dr. Vith for making the time and uh, uh, really be with us and uh, comment in every single case. There's no question that he's a legend in uh, this field. And uh, his meeting is really the meeting that I personally I have very deep in my heart. One of the really best meetings that I've ever been. So, and I'm looking forward for um, in November for Orlando. At the same time, I would like to thank also Dr. Rana Fifi, Dr. Tom McGillivray, uh, Dr. Jason Lee, and uh, my co-moderator, Palma Shaw, and uh, Rodney White uh, for being with us tonight, as well as uh, Dr. Crazier and uh, Dr. Alan Lamston. And also would like to thank uh, Metronic for sponsoring this um, event and for helping us with the YES program for the uh, International Society of Endovascular Specialists. Palma? Yeah, I just wanted to thank all the presenters. I know it's a, it's a hard job to put on the show, but you did a beautiful job, and we're appreciative of that. And I'd also like to thank uh, Ashley and Jonah for helping us put this all together and orchestrating the arrangements for such a hybrid meeting. I think uh, we're hoping to get back to in-person meetings, but this type of hybrid meeting allowed people like me and, and Jason and Rod to participate in this meeting and our trainees and Dr. Veith, so we're happy that everybody was participating. Thank you very much. And uh, you, can, you can watch actually uh, this meeting again uh, is on YouTube and uh, online. Thank you so much.